thanks for those of you that are watching. Um, I'm Jenny Hines. I have, um, my kennel name is Rossmore, and I've been in Shelties my whole life. Um, I just want to give you a little brief history of my involvement in the breed, and then also um, um, a little history of the breed, and then we're going to look at some dogs. And what I want to do, if you're, if you're interested in just having knowledge of the breed, um, I'm going to try to address that. And also, I'm going to go into a little breeding theory, because I feel like that's really interesting for people to know um, why pairs, why I put pairs together and, and where I'm trying to go with my breeding program. So I feel like I'm going to try to um, cover some uh, knowledge of the breed, but also um, some some breedings and, and why, where I've gotten where I've gotten and where I might want to go in the future. So we're going to have questions after each section. So um, you can ask questions if you want, and we have somebody monitoring um, the feed, and they're going to uh, let me know what the questions are at the end of each section. So um, I've been breeding. I've been involved in the breeds for my whole life. My, my mom um, got her first Sheltie in 1964. She was interested in dogs since she was a young child and would have one dog at a time, all kinds of different breeds because her parents were not on board with dogs, so she was allowed to have one at a time. And she grew up in Greenville, South Carolina, and they had a show once a year and people would give her dogs and let her, let, let her um, show a dog for them and that's where she kind of got hooked. Uh, my mom is Rose Tomlin. She got her first Sheltie in 1964 and had her first litter in 1966. Um, I, the same year that her litter was born, I was born, so this has been a breed that I've had around me my whole entire life. I started going to dog shows when I was very young, but my mom wouldn't let me really go in the ring other than just a brief um, taking a dog back in until I was 10 and I was able to select my own puppy and uh, start showing showing my puppy. So over the years, um, my main interest has been breeding um, over um, showing. I've had quite a lot of success, but mostly my goal is to, for my dogs to win specialties versus this versus competing over and over again in all breed shows. Um, so my dogs are specialty winners for the most part. That's always my goal, that all my dogs are specialty winners when I their points at specialties. And also I do special dogs from time to time and most of them are specialty best of breed winners as well. I got my start with obviously my mom. So she's one of my mentors, obviously. Um, she really taught me how she, as a novice, was able to kind of break away from learning about the breed to actually developing a breeding program. I remember her telling me seeing one inspirational dog at a national somewhere and from that point forward really making up her mind that if she was going to get the, the heads and the type the way she wanted it, she was going to have to do breedings that often cost money or, or, or um, were due required her to send her bitches out or just not necessarily breed within her friend friend group, which I think is so important. What you really have to, as a breeder, do the utmost um, effort to make your breedings go forward in your breeding program and having one, um, one goal or several goals in mind. So that's kind of, um, I also as a child uh, was interested in um, visiting other breeders for weekends. There was uh, Gene Simmons, who's one of the older breeders in the in the breed and has been a really great educator for our breed. I used to go up and see her on the weekends when I was probably 11 or 12 and then transitioned to working <coughs> for um, Tom and Niamh Cohen for McDega Shelties and I lived summers with them, went to shows with them and um, and 
really learn uh, an awful lot about Shelties, but not so much the showing of it, although that was a factor, but breeding and, um, you know, development of dogs and and bringing sh puppies along. And Shelties are a breed that they really require you to um, just be involved every step of the way. They're not a kind of breed that you can um, leave in a kennel and hope that they develop on their own. Um, their ears take a lot of work, their coat, their temperaments. So it's really a breed that you, and they're, they change a lot from the time they're young puppies till the time that they're six months, a year, and then they might, may or may not develop into who the dog that you want them to, breed, to be based on the puppy that they were. Um, sometimes they just don't hold their promise. So that makes it kind of a difficult breed in that way. And I also, in um, high school and college, um, on weekends, would work for a fair amount of all breed handlers, and that knowledge is invaluable in the husbandry factor of having your dogs be in a clean environment, have them the proper nutrition, proper exercise, so I'm a big believer in, in that to, to add to success of, um, of dogs in your breeding program. So, with that, I will give you just kind of a brief history of the breed. The first known, um, the first known um, kind of uh, sighting of the ancestor of a Sheltie was seen in this uh, in a engraving in a Sheltie um, of what was thought to be a Sheltie in 1840 in the Shetland Islands. There was little known about the breed before 1906, and the at that point, Shelties were not in the U.S. Um, about this, about about that same time, around 1908, uh, the standard was recognized by the English Kennel Club, and there was one dog entered at Crufts that year. Um, fast forward to 1929, the Shelties were in the U.S. by this time, and the American Kennel, American Shetland Sheepdog Association was developed was um, started in 1929 at Westminster Kennel Club. So it's a relatively new breed, and to the dog that was believed to be the origin of the Sheltie um, didn't honestly look very much like a Sheltie. And so breeders came together and decided what type they wanted, and, how, and they combined um, dogs to kind of get towards the type that they really wanted to, um, to see the Sheltie um, to be. That included collie crosses, some crosses with um, English toy spaniels, and um, Pomeranians. And so um, we struggle as breeders um, with, to this day, because 1929 was not that long ago, relatively speaking, when you talk about generations of dogs, and um, we some of the breeds that were involved, we sometimes get throwbacks to that. For instance, with the Collies, sometimes we have dogs with longer heads, and and uh, we struggle with dogs going oversized, and um, from the Chihuahuas, I mean, Chihuahuas, Pomeranians, we get prick ears, domi skulls, round eyes, and, and that kind of thing. So it's kind of a constant struggle, and because um, these crosses were done relatively recently when you when you consider generations of dogs, um, we this is something we struggle with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some dogs. We're going to talk about the dogs. Um, we're going to look at their balance and symmetry because that really, as a judge, um, that's what you're going to really want to look at first. These dogs should be symmetrical. They should be elegant. Um, they should um, uh, be what's the word I'm looking for, um, no, nothing out of place. We don't want to see anything extreme. And sometimes um, this is difficult, and but very, very important to teach yourself to see this in, in our breed because it's very important. Then we're going to put the dogs up on the table. We're going to go over the heads we're going to, and the bodies. We're going to put them down again and look at their expression. Shelties generally um, don't have the expression that they um, would normally have on the table. They get groomed on the table. They spend a lot of time on the table. So uh, we like to look at their expression on the ground. Um, then we're going to do um, 
an up and back, and then we're going to look at a couple more pairs of dogs. So the first dogs I have up are two males. They both, one is just under the two-year-old mark, and one just turned two a week ago. These dogs, these two dogs, are different, but also correct and have virtue. So, where are we going to have them? Okay, so um, the first one is a. We need the dog. Somebody, I don't know. The first one is this dog that will be two next month. Um, so he's young and he has a lot of virtue, which is obviously important. Um, but he, he has um, some room to grow. What I really like about this dog is he's very, very typey. He, his, he has um, a beautiful outline with pretty much um, no, nothing out of place. So um, I'm going to bring the other dog over to compare. So the, this one here, he, um, he just turned two last week. So there's a lot of things about him that um, are, are there because he's immature. So at this age, especially with a male, we, okay. we, don't, want, um, okay. we don't want too much dog. We're forgiving of some things like just um, slab-sided or lack of development in the rear, I mean in the um, rib, rib area, and also they might be a little bit um, a little bit lacking in muzzle or foreface, and, um, but they should have kind of the framework of a correct head, obviously a framework of um, balance and symmetry. When you look at these dogs, you don't see any particular part out of balance. And so I like to, as a judge, stand really far back from these dogs and get a sense of their balance. They should be elegant. They should have a flat back. They should ha be a series of curves, um, bend and stifle. Um, so that's what, so Kate, turn this one this way and then turn him around. Yeah, sometimes um, markings can be deceiving. So it's always a good idea, if you're judging, um, to look at opposite, um, opposite, the opposite side, just to get a sense of the, of the dog. So um, we're gonna put these two dogs up on the table. We're gonna read the excerpt of the standard about the specific area that we're going for. And the reason I like to always read the standard when I'm doing something like this, some kind of educational thing, is that I really feel it's important we have a very detailed, well-written standard, and I feel like we should train ourselves to, um, you can put them back up on the table, we need to train ourselves to understand those words and use those words because the other words are, um, can be interpreted in different ways. Um, our breed founders that worked on this standard were very careful to choose the words that they, they, cho they chose. So try to learn the standard and use the words as much as you can when you describe um, describe the dog. So um, we did general appearance, but I'm just going to read it. The Shetland Sheepdog, like the Collie, traces to Border Collies of Scotland, which transported to the Shetland Islands and crossed with small, intelligent, long-haired breeds, was reduced to proportions. Um, so that's the general appearance. It, uh, you know, the Shetland Chief Gallery is a small, alert, rough-coated, long-haired working dog. He must be sound, agile, and sturdy. The outline should be so symmetrical that no part of appears out of proportion to the whole dog. Dogs should appear masculine, bitches feminine. Okay, so a Sheltie should stand between 13 and 16 inches. The height is designed by a line perpendicular to the ground from the top of the shoulder. So that's where we're judging the height. It is a disqualification to be under 13 or over 16. And yeah. um, the dog standing naturally, the parallel, the uh, four legs parallel to the line of measurement um, 
Can you, can you mess with me? For the line of, the line of uh, measurement. So basically we want them to be equidistant from the, from the shoulder to the elbow and then the elbow to the ground. So we don't want long legs. We don't want um, little... Hey, Jen. Short legs. We're just going to give people a break for a minute while we try to work on the mic. Okay, I guess we're having trouble with the mic. So bear with us for a minute while we while we try to figure it hold out. Hold on, hold on. Go ahead and flip, around, flip it around. I'll turn the phone around. Okay. The camera on them, and then we can okay. play with it. Mm -hmm. Now, okay. do you know the app well enough to change any settings? No, let me see. I wonder if it's better if we just... Maybe we can care. just keep... I don't care what they're saying. What's the settings down here? There must be a settings for the microphone. For the it microphone. Might be... I don't know if it's a... something on the phone. So, um, so our, our, our breed is a table breed, to go over them. I, I, as a judge, don't like to really assess balance and symmetry on the table unless you have a situation where the grass is really high or that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to read the, the portion on head, and then I'm going to go over the head for you. Um, the head should be refined, and its shape when viewed for the top or side should be a long, blunt wedge tapering slight, slightly from ears to nose. Um, the expression, um, the contours chiseling of the head, the shape of the eye, instead of the ears, the placement, shape, and color of the eyes combined to produce expression. Normally, the expression should be alert, gentle, intelligent, and questioning with dark almond-shaped rims set somewhat obliquely in the skull. Color must be dark with blue or, blue or merle eyes possible permissible in blue merles only. Uh, faults would be loud, light or round, large or too small, prominent haws. Ears are small and flexible, placed high, carried three-fourths erect with tips breaking forward. When in repose, the ears fold lengthwise and are shown uh, thrown back into the frills. Faults are set too low, pound, prick, fat, twisted ears, leather too thick or too thin. The top of the skull should be flat, showing no prominence. Okay, this is so important to type, to have a flat skull, and it's something that we don't, that sometimes we, we uh, have a dome, domey skull or a, a rise over here. This is so important to type. The plane should be parallel, so parallel, parallel with the, um, the stop, a well-placed and a slight but definite stop um, to, to put the top skull on a higher plane, okay? A lot of times when people are judging, and I realize that to a lot of people that don't know a lot about this breed, that this is a challenging breed, and I'm gonna, when we get to this dog, I'm gonna show you um, why that might be. So then you wanna go over the sides of the head. The sides of the head should be smooth. The muscle should smoothly fit into the cheekbones with um, not a lot of prominence here. Now on a dog this age, sometimes they have a lack of flesh here. And as they get older, the flesh comes in, which gives us the perception of corners on the head. That is not um, really mentioned in our standard, but is something that as the dog gets older and the flesh fills in here and here, the head becomes more pleasing or should be more pleasing with age. Now, sometimes we have trouble with dogs that are too much too soon, so their heads appear to be of good quality at six, eight, nine months, and even two years, and as the dog matures, 
we have a, the, the um, zygomatic arches come out and we have you know kind of these handlebars and that's considered um, faulty. So I hope everyone can see that this dog has beautiful planes. He has a slight but definite stop. He has good underjaw and depth of underjaw. He has a tight lip line and so and a nice um, throat line. So you're basically a series of lines. You have the top of the muzzle, the top of the skull, the lip line, and the underneath here to um, to produce you know a very beautiful head. Okay, this dog because he's very flat here will continue to get better with age. This is a dog, just on a side note, that is not my breeding. I bought him from um, Laureate Shelties in Canada. Very, they have some very, very high quality dogs. Um, I kind of bought him on a whim one day, but I just really love so many things about him that I really wanted to incorporate some of his virtue into my breeding program. So I'm really excited to have him. He finished quickly with specialty majors and um, a best of breed over specials the day he finished and also a, a big best of breed um, the day after he finished. And he finished at about the age of, um, of 10, 10 months or so. So uh, the shoulder, um, from, from the point of shoulder to the withers should be sloped at a um, um, 35 degree angle. And then the upper arm should match, should meet the, um, the shoulder blade at a 90 degree angle. The upper arm needs to be long enough to have the um, four legs under, under the body. Um, sometimes a problem in this breed is a short upper arm, which means the legs are going to be more forward. And when they move, they're going to be restricted. Okay, so then we go down, we want good spring of rib. This dog um, could have better spring of rib, but I would be happier with having him have less spring of rib now than too much spring of rib um, to be the amount of spring of rib that he has. And then as he matures, have uh, too much spring of rib that is gonna bring him like out of the elbows. So we have good rib, rib spring. Um, the the uh, rib cage tapers to give the, um, the elbow a place to uh, be tucked in so he's not out of the elbows and he's not moving um, wide in the front. The leg, the foreleg should be strong. Uh, the pasterns should be uh, sinewy and um, straight. He should have um, tight uh, toes and oval foot and good, um, good arch on the pads, okay? So as we go down the body, we have the back. Someone was asking if you could repeat about shoulder layback. Okay, so shoulder layback here. Um, the, the, the shoulder layback, you, you, you see an, an angle here. Um, you draw a plane from here straight, This is, and the shoulder lays back this way, okay? And then meets with the upper arm this way. So this is a 90 degree angle. Uh, and we want to lay back um, at a 35 degree angle. So, so the back is relatively short. This is not a square dog. They're slightly longer than tall. It, it appears long when they have the correct angulation. Uh, the pelvis is set into the spine at a 30 degree angle, measured this way and this way. Um, the upper um, femur set into the pelvis at a 90 degree angle. And then the um, tibia also set at a 90 degree angle. Um, the length of tibia um, has the, um, connects to the hock. The hock should be well let down and perpendicular to the ground. The tail should be long enough to meet the hock, um, which is due to the set of the tail and the rounding of the crew. So this is a very high quality dog as a result of years of breeding of you know another breeder. Um, he has extreme virtue. Does he have faults? He absolutely does. But he has such extreme good virtue that it makes up for the faults. So when you're judging our breed, um, we want you to really appreciate the faults rather than finding, I mean, the, excuse me, the virtue rather than going out of your way to find the faults. This is just a magnificent dog. 
um, beautiful, elegant, long neck and a series of curves. So you want arch to the neck, you want a flat back, you want this curve and, um, and a moderate tuck up and um, you know, I, there's not a lot I would change. We have a question about the length of loin in proportion to rib spring, or rib length of rib, rib. So, hmm? oh, we, so we had a question about length of loin versus rib spring or length of back? I'm sorry, versus um, what are the body proportions ribbing to loin ratio? No. The loin, I think, you know, the back is moderately long, which, you know, ends at the rib cage, and the loin, you know, I could read the exact words because honestly, um, that's more important than me, like making up, um, making up the words. Um, let's see. Um, the neck should be muscular, arched, and of sufficient length to carry the head proudly. Uh, the the ribs should be well sprung, flattened at the lower half to add for free play of shoulder and um, and uh, foreleg. The abdomen moderately tucked up. Uh, there should be a slight arch over the loin and the croup should slope gradually to the rear. The hip bone should be set at a 30 degree angle. Um, and then, um, so I, you know, you don't want like a, a totally long loin, um, but you want enough length of back to loin so the dog doesn't look uh, short body. You don't, if they're short body, they're going to be out of proportion. So this is something that you want to you want to um, get back and look at the dog and make sure they're symmetrical. Like I said, they should be slightly longer than tall. They're not a long. Uh, they're not a square breed. So the body looks moderately long, but it's more has to do with correct angulation here and correct angulation here. The back is relatively short, and the loin is is relatively short as well but the combination so we're 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 talking this um this is the length of back which includes the back and the loin and then um um you know that creates a shorter you know a shorter when you actually measure it it's shorter but then when you see the whole dog it's moderately long okay so we're going to move to this dog um, a different type of dog, but still um, very pleasing. He's a two-year-old dog, or uh, just turned two. He has, when I go over his head, he has a little different head, a little more length. Um, I would give him a little less fill here, but that can go away with age, and this stop area cleans up. He has a good um, top of the muzzle, a good skull, the skull should not drop off. It should be flat on top, which is very much is, and it's straight back to the occiput. When you go over his head, I would give him a little more muzzle here, but he's immature, and if it matches his degree of rib spring, um, I'm less worried about whether the muzzle is going to stay um, stay uh, like this, so and not fill in. Okay, so, but he has adequate a good amount of underjaw. And he just has a little more length of head overall. The, um, the length of muzzle to back skull should be equidistant, uh, measured from the corner of the eye to the end of the nose and the corner of the eye to the occiput. Um, this proportion can be seen. Um, it's probably better to train your eye and not do this if you're judging the breed in the ring, okay? His eye is well set and a good shape with dark rims. He happen to have uh, dark eyes, but also has a blue eye on this side. Dark, one dark eye, one blue eye. The eyes can be different colors. The blue can either be solid, it can be different colored, or blue, it could have a brown eye with just flecks of blue in this color only. Only blue. We're getting questions on expression. We're just okay, going to do expression when we put them on the ground. So, again, good layback and shoulder, nice length of upper arm. Um, the, the, the right um, angle of the shoulder creates prosternum. Sometimes at this age, you're going to have less prosternum, but that will often develop with age. That's the ideal. So when you're, as a breeder, you might have a dog like this, that this dog's finished. He finished at an early age with specialty majors. 
but he, um, you know, is not the finished product. So as this dog gets older, because he has really smooth bones here and a flat skull, I fully expect his head to get better, and as the flesh fills in here and here, you will get the, the corners that we talk about. Again, corners aren't in the, in the standard, but that's kind of like what we like to see. All right, so good lay back of shoulder, good length of back, length of loin. He has a nice long tail. He has correct length of uh, femur to tibia, which creates um, a pleasing stifle, and his hocks are perpendicular, okay? So that's his story. Now what we're gonna do... Someone asked about um, let down of hock and extension, hock extension. Well, we're gonna move these dogs so you'll you'll see, but um, this, this, if it's correct here, what you want it, and that sometimes we see sickle hocks, they should be perpendicular to the ground. When the, when the sickle, when you have sickle hawks, they can't extend their leg when they move. We really want to see them extend their leg, and the drive should be from the rear. So what we're going to do, Sheltie, Sheltie's, uh, you can't really get true Sheltie expression um, when they're on the table, and a dog should not be faulted for not showing on the table. Okay, so we're going to put them down on the ground, we're going to do a quick up and back, and then we're going to look at their expression. Okay, so... Why don't you do him up and back, and then show show him. That one. Yeah. Okay. So as they move, and um, at a faster pace, the legs um, should converge on a on a uh, on a single line. The um, the outer portion of the feet, you know, touching the single line um, as they come at you. This dog is a little close in front, but due to his lack of um, chest drop um, and rib spring, he's going to move um, closer in the front, and I'm not so worried about it. His expression is questioning. His, this dog's eye is exceptional. It's the proper color. It's the proper shape and the set. And we say we want them set obliquely, which is when this tip is slightly forward than here. You don't want a round eye. You don't want a forward set eye. You want them blending into the, the sides of the skull like that. Um, you don't want prominence over the eye because that ruins the expression. And sometimes we have, like I said, very forward eyes. We don't want bulging eyes and we don't want round eyes or light eyes. This dog um, has beautiful dark eyes, but sometimes you see them that are significantly lighter than that. And this dog has a beautiful, beautiful expression. Okay? All right, that's all for him. You want to bring Nash? So this dog is a young dog that um, is Finnish, but I'm, I uh, has, so again, um, it's this, the, at a faster speed, the, um, the rear movement should converge. And he's a little close in front as well, but um, again, right now, I'm not too worried about that because of his age and amount of development. Now this dog, you can see, has a little bit of a longer head. His foreface is a little longer, but it matches his length of back skull. His eye is beautiful, his expression questioning, and um, soft and alert and inquisitive. Um, the Sheltie expression, I feel like, is very, very important and something I'm not 100% sure um, is seen very often. I mean. I don't want to say that it's seen seen often, but um, it it's some. I feel like in some areas of the country, in particular, we're losing the beautiful expression. Okay, Shelties are devoted to their owners. They can be aloof with strangers. They shouldn't show any fear or um, or snippiness. They should some often. They're just kind of aloof towards strangers. They're not too interested in people that have never fed them or interacted with them. As you can see, this dog is completely fine. Um, has no problem, um, you know, with with anybody looking at him or that kind of thing. Um, again, let's look at his outline on the um, on the ground. Um, circle him, Kate. <coughs> 
<clears throat> good proportions, good body proportions, flat back, nice um, rounded croup, and beautiful um, amount of neck, and his head is held over the line of the back due to the length of neck and a series of curves. He's not behaving as well as he could, um, but a series of curves, the way the, set, the, the, the neck is arched, um, the head is, is, is um, carried proudly above the line of the back, and the back is good proportions. The other thing too, this dog here, he has that marking right over the loin, and sometimes that can um, give you an impression of uh, too much length of back on um, turnaround. So you just actually have to wa watch the uh, markings. Someone had a question on type. Yeah. And does type vary much between colors if you don't breed all colors together? Um, okay, so the question is, um, does type vary much between colors if you don't breed all the colors together? Well, we have different types in Shelties, and to me, they don't... I'm not, I don't have a problem with different types of Shelties as long as they have virtue and the head qualities um, and, the, and the body's qualities are correct. So with this dog, you know, he might have a little um, more length of neck than the last one, but, but his length of head matches his body. If you put the head of the sable one neck on the head of this dog, he wouldn't look in balance or the other way around. If you put his head on the sable dog, it's not going to look in balance. So you have to kind of take each individual and I feel like there's no lacking of type. I mean, this dog and the other dog that I showed you, um, the sable dog are not particularly related. The sable dog is more from a sable family. This dog is, he's, his grandsire is a sable, but he, um, his, uh, his sire is a sol solidly AOC, AOAC, which is any other loud color, blues or tries, blacks or blue and whites. Um, so there really shouldn't be um, lack of type. I'm not so... I'm not so interested in difference of type as I am in lack of type. So I'm not sure that answers the question, but maybe when we bring the rest of the dogs over. Okay, so the next dog we're gonna see, thanks Kate, the next dog we're gonna see is a 10-year-old um, tricolor male. Um, so this is a fully developed, um, mature male, who incidentally finished as an eight-month-old puppy and won an award of merit at the National um, when he was 10 months old. He's since won um, a couple of award of merits and uh, group placements, and last year won the, um, the Sheltie National um, in 2019. So what's nice about this dog is, um, again, I think he's balanced. When we go over his head, you will see that it's more of a finished product. Now, the reason why this dog um, finished quickly as a puppy is because he had quite a lot of virtue. He might have had some um, things that were immature, but um, but you would expect of an immature dog. So let's put him up on the table and go over him. And, um, and you can see probably the... Um, from his head, the difference between the first two dogs that we saw. So, you go over his head, he's extremely flat on top. The sides are smooth, okay? He has good fill of muzzle, good finish of under jaw, um, good fill under the eyes, and the flesh here, and it's hard to see, um, I think, but, so, Sometimes, and on the other two, you might have had a little more prominence of this bone, meaning like out from the plane of the skull. Um, but as they get older, assuming they're going in the right direction, and um, you know, hopefully they get better with age, that's, that's the ideal. Um, you're going to have this flesh full in, fill in, and you're going to have a much you know, smoother side of the head. And it's you know, a wedge from the top. And uh, so you want to taper from the nose to the to the ears. Okay, this dog has a beautiful, beautiful head. He had a beautiful head as a puppy, and he still has a beautiful head at this age. Okay, so um, a good throat line, 
a good lip line. He does have, because of his age, sometimes we get a little separation here where you can see the teeth, but that's pretty acceptable for a dog of this age. Okay, he has really good post-sternum because he's an older dog um, and he's mature. He has the layback and shoulder. He has the correct length of upper arm. And then he has good spring of rib where the other dogs, you know, were laughing there, but age appropriate. Um, if they have a really wide head where they have not a pleasing eye or they have, you know, kind of a snippiness to their muzzle, um, those things won't necessarily get better with age. So if I see those kind of things, I'm pretty unforgiving of that. Um, but if this dog needs a little fill here and maybe um, you can feel the bone away from the side of the head because this flesh hasn't filled in, I'm perfectly happy with that. This dog doesn't drop off. The, um, top, the occiput is here. So we have a straight skull to the back of the, um, to the top of the occiput right here, okay? So we have the good, the good um, shoulder layback, spring of rib with still a flatness here so he doesn't appear, so he's not out at the elbows and it's not um, gonna make him, you know, swing his leg around because he has to lose, he has to uh, bypass this area, okay? So he has the right length of that. He appears um, slightly longer than tall. He has really good muscle definition, and as a breeder, I'm a firm believer in dogs being running. I don't, um, I don't treadmill my dogs. I don't bike them. They, um, uh, they're, they're exercise freely. They're out in a, in, um, in a large yard with part of it on an incline that they can, they can run and you know see things. I think it's so healthy for their mind to be exposed and um, be outside where they hear things and things happen and they've got to kind of figure it out for themselves which gives them confidence. So that's kind of where we are, where we are, you know, with this dog, okay? I have a question on coat texture. Coat texture should, uh, so we want it to be a harsh coat. It's double coated. These dogs are, you know, have had a fairly big shed this year already, which, um, sometimes can work against them. A dog this age generally doesn't go down to nothing. Um, the, the two earlier younger dogs um, you saw with a little less coat, but I also think that's a really good opportunity to see their body balance because sometimes they get lost in the coat. So we want a standoffish coat that's harsh in texture. They do have a woolly undercoat that they mostly lose in the summer um, that keeps them warm. This is a dog that was developed in the, in the um, Shetland Islands, which is a very harsh climate. It's way up, um, it's part of Scotland, but also way up above Scotland. So um, harsh winters and lots of wind. And so it needs to be a dog that can withstand that. And the coat as well is a um, factor. Okay, let's put him on the ground and look at his down and back. And we also might do, um, try to do, get some side movement from him and, um, and evaluate expression. So, oh, wait a minute. Why don't you try that again? So bring him back now and then, so you can see that this dog has better, you know, more developed movement and more, um, more of the legs converging to the center line. As his trot gets um, um, gets faster, he's he's um, moving closer in the rear, which is correct. At a slower speed, um, sometimes the um, the hocks don't come together. Um, they appear to be wider than when he gets his speed. This dog has a beautiful expression. He has a dark eye. It's set obliquely in the head. Um, you can see his uh, the shape of his skull. Um, his He has a good ear set. And he's just an overall very quality dog. Um, through his years, um, he has you know, finished as a puppy, won an award of merit as a puppy, won several award of merits at a, as, at a, um, um, as an adult, and then ultimately won the national specialty at just under nine years old last year. So this is a dog that showed quality, um, is, uh, you know, shown, and um, a dog that holds his quality, okay? And also he's um, the sire of um, 
17 or 18 champions. So, all right, let's go to the next two, which are we're gonna we're gonna transition to bitches. Um, we we have two bitches. We have a little drizzle going on and might get um, more rain, but for right now, um, for right now we're good. And often, um, penalized for that, but a dog of this amount of virtue should be, um, judged on their virtue versus their showmanship. Okay, so she's four years old. Um, again, good balance, good arch of neck. Her head is um, is held uh, high over the, length, the flatness of the back, and she's feminine. You want dogs masculine and bitches feminine, and it doesn't have anything to do... Are we gonna do Let's come. Oh, we were gonna do, all right, we'll bring the thing back. Um, so, there, this dog is obviously a bitch, and the others were obviously dogs. And um, the two first dogs we looked at are, are you know, bigger dogs, but still, um, we can also have this bitch is probably about 15 inches or 15 and a quarter, but she's still uh, feminine. I think you could tell right off the bat that she's a bitch versus a dog. The second one we're gonna look at, so this is a four-year-old bitch. This is a nine-year-old bitch. Um, she's spayed, so we're gonna have a little more hair and I would like to see her right now. I've never thought of her as like long necessarily, but she's looking a little longer at this point. Um, again, not like in her day, she's a champion, especially when her group plays her, but um, she hasn't been shown since she was a champion because uh, she didn't particularly enjoy it. Um, this bitch has a beautiful, beautiful skull and a, um, a, a flat top skull. And what we're gonna do, um, now, because it's raining, we're gonna um, just go under the tent with the um, going over them, and then we're gonna, if it's not too much of a downpour, we will uh, we will uh, try to move them as well. Let me know if you can't hear me because we have some rain going on at the moment. Um, I was glad that we were able to do as much as we could out, out uh, outside. Okay, so this fish, again, very, very beautiful head, virtuous, but feminine. Maybe not as much muzzle, but definitely appropriate for her head. She's very, very flat here. She has, she has a good amount of uh, finish of underjaw, she has a beautiful lip line, and then she has um, a beautiful um, line under her on her throat line and under the muscle. So this is flat, very flat, so important in our breed. We're getting so many more uh, prominent um, prominent top skulls with like a lump over the um, frontal bone, and really not correct at all. And we have um, this, her doesn't drop off. And here's the top of the occiput, so it's straight back and flat all the way back. This, again, beautiful. Um, this one resists. Um, beautiful um, profile with the right amount of stop. Okay? Um, again, this one. Keep going. Good layback, good length of upper arm. She's four, and I don't really consider her fully mature. I feel like... This will probably, she has good spring of rib and good depth of chest, but I don't really feel, I feel like she could really even um, mature a little bit more and that would not be a bad thing. Um, so again, upper length to back, length of loin, the right set of the pelvis, 30 degree angle from the um, pelvis to the spine here, and then uh, 90 degree where the femur goes into the pelvis. And, um, where the tibia um, goes into the lower leg there, and good bend of stifle and well left down hock right here. Uh, end of the tail comes to the hock, well muscled here, 
um, so important to the development as a four-year-old. Um, she's had a couple litters, and I feel like this development when they're running constantly and outside uh, is so important to maintaining their top line. Some, um, some families tend to uh, dip in the top line with age, and, but also even with families that don't, you can get that dip of top line if they're not well developed you know, in the back and loin area. Um, so to me, that is, condition is so important. Um, and I think it's something in, um, sometimes in our breed that people overlook uh, the importance of exercise and having them get out. Okay, so this one, this is a nine-year-old bitch. She's spayed, but she has a little more hair and the texture isn't quite as good because we get that sometimes when they're spayed. But this bitch here is so incredibly typey and her um, amount of skull, I mean her, the flatness, the, round, the um, amount of muzzle, and the lip line and the underneath here is straight. So we've got a series of straight lines. The lip line, this, this, and this, and parallel planes separated by a slight but definite stop. Her, this is a pretty good example of how you can see the eye um, oblique here um, set into the head. Sometimes, again, we get the eyes forward. Sometimes when we get more skull, like the zygomatic arches stick out more, we get a forward set eye, which is not correct. The other thing we get a fair amount is um, a deep stop. You see that a, a fair amount. And then what you get is a, um, a thicker feel um, to the head, more depth here, and which is extremely faulty and really, to me, you cannot have a typey um, shelty head without the um, really light head like this. Okay, so this bitch is feminine and just unbelievable amount of quality. Um, so she has good layback of shoulder. At this age, she has more prosternum. Um, and um, a fully developed rib spring. Again, a flatness here to tuck the legs in, okay? Good um, symmetry, tail's long enough, a nice rounded croup. You don't want a high tail set. You have a high tail set, they tend to um, you know, keep their tail high like this. The tail should, can be off the back or, or, or like this. You don't want a gay tail like this and you don't want it hooked over the back like that. That just ruins um, the, um, the look of the dog as it's moving. So again, when you're judging this breed, and also as a breeder, you really, really, really need to be honest with yourself about what you're getting, okay? Once you get into these head folds, uh, a deep stop, the head over the, the rise over the eyes, it's hard to get rid of, okay? Um, a lot of times people will say in shelties that you can get, um, you can, you know, the structure takes a long time to develop and you can improve the head in one generation. Um, I uh, don't think that's true at all based on experience. Um, so you want the whole, the whole dog. Sometimes we get into discussions with shelties where people say like it's a herding dog, it should be sound. And, um, and some people say, you know, oh, well, uh, breeders and only dogs with good heads can win in specialties. I say, I want the whole dog. I want good symmetry, I want good structure, and I want a good headpiece. Um, I want, to me, type is a beautiful dog with a beautiful outline that can move and has proper head, um, head detail with immense virtue and few faults. Again, these dogs all have faults, but, um, but they also have um, extreme virtue. So when I'm judging, you know, sometimes I don't necessarily put up the same type of dog, but I look for dogs that where they're good, they're very good, and, um, and, and, and few faults, okay? So let's put these guys on the ground and stop raining mostly so we can um, take a look at them uh, go up, up and back and then also um, their expression. Right, so take her. So again, this is a nine-year-old bitch. You gotta move her fast, Kate. Okay. So her legs, her, her um, at a faster trot, her rear is converging on a center line, and the same with her, um, her front. So I think down and back, um, you know, this is pretty good movement. Her expression is very beautiful. Her eye is very correct. It's very, very dark. Um, 
Again, she's not, not an over-enthusiastic show dog, but that's okay. As long as you see the ears um, at some point, uh, that's, that's what you, you need. And as long as you don't see fear um, or bad behavior, you know, hiding behind the handler or resisting being touched. So this dog, um, this particular one, if you haven't fed her ever or recently, um, really kind of has no use for, um, for you. So let's, let's, um, let's move this one from the side. And um, so Kate, why don't you, no, let's do it this way, but why don't you just kind of go down there and get her going so by the time she's here, she's like in a full gait. So I find this one to be an adequate mover. Um, I think she's a decent mover. She has a fair amount of reach and drive. Um, I'd like to see her um, push off the rear. The drive should be from the rear. Um, and you know, I would like this one uh, to have a little more, but I wouldn't necessarily, um, because of her overall quality, um, fault her. Well, now she's doing better with the rear. Um, Okay, and let's, why don't we uh, bring, so we did the expression, so let's, let's, why don't we move her from the side now, and then we'll do her down and back, just because we're in position. Any question? Okay. No? Okay. So this one doesn't particularly like to be on the leash, so you're getting a little bit more of a dragginess, which you know I would definitely fault her for if she's moving like this. She doesn't always move like this, but I also wanted to let you know. Again, um, you know I'd like them see them really, uh, you know, move out, and I'm going to show you a couple more that are a little more enthusiastic uh, movers. This one has a beautiful eye. It's set. You can notice this is a good example of a merled eye, and even with the with the tan, I mean with the brown eye, you see different um, kind of degrees of brown in there and also different degrees of blue in the blue eye. Again, you can see a little fleck. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't, depending on the size of the pupil, whether it's um, dilated or, or um, you know, constricted due to the um, amount of light, especially if you're outside. So this is a good eye. You have to train your eye to look at an eye like this, even though it can be distracting um, because um, because of the blue in the eye. But the part of the eye that's brown should be dark. So this bitch has a um, really beautiful expression. You can see the contours of the head. It's set obliquely. You don't want it to be set forward. You don't want prominence here or prominence here. You don't want them to be too wide set here as well. Okay, so the expression is the contours of the head, the shape and set of the eye, the ear set, and um, um, you know, that's it, the way they, you know, again, you know, she's a good show dog, but she's not gonna kill it, which she shouldn't be penalized for. Um, we don't want necessarily these um, crazy, not crazy, but like, you know, enthusiastic carrier temperaments. I love a good show dog, but we don't want a Sheltie that's so um, kind of spastic that we can't, um, you know, really, sometimes their movement is off and um, I wouldn't necessarily fault that kind of temperament, but I also don't want to um, fault this kind of temperament because um, this is especially a winning bitch um, and she's been shown very sparingly, um, but a, a bitch that, um, you know, I'm really is a, a factor in my breeding program going forward. Okay, so the next one we're going to show you is a bitch that's almost a year old um, and she's... Um, um, she, her birthday's mid-July, so she's um, almost a year old. She's got, in my opinion, a lot of things that are nice about you and her. The reason why I'm showing you this bitch right now is because I want you to see that a dog at this age, you want them to have a place to go. Um, so she, um, have her take a step up or circle with her. Yeah, so she's not going to stand like perfectly the whole the whole time. Um, her her legs could be a little far, far under her. This dog's only been shown once um, before the pandemic started, and she's enthusiastic. She's a good show dog. Her she has good length of neck. She has um, good bend and stifle, and the and the um, the. Um, 
the hawk well let down and perpendicular to the ground. I mean, she's not she's not 100% trained, so she's not going to have every foot in the right place. I think that she's built very well, so her so her um, her leg should be in the right place. And I think due to tr lack of training at this point or just lack of experience, um, she kind of stands with um, her legs further on, further. Um, forward. Um, let's go over this one because um, this is a good example of a puppy at, at an age that um, that wouldn't necessarily um, be ready to show now. Although she would be, you know, a nice um, puppy cl a puppy class exhibit and might would probably win some puppy classes at specialties, probably some sweepstakes. Um, but she definitely has room to improve which I'd rather see than one that's like completely together because it's very, um, very uh, likely that that dog might end up being too much as an adult. So this one has um, a pretty skull. She could be a little flatter here, but sometimes as their heads develop and their heads pull out, they do so at different lengths. Um, but what's good about her is going to stay good. Like I said, there's just a slight, slight prominence here, but I expect that to flatten out. And the reason why is because I see this a lot in this age. Sometimes she was very flat as like a three, four month old puppy, but she got a little bit of prominence at about five to eight months when their head lengthens. And so sometimes we see that. So we kind of have to let them, as a breeder, we have to let them go through stages, but we also have to be honest with ourselves about, at a certain time, you know, what would be a deal breaker. So this bitch has, you know, a pretty top one, I mean, top of skull, I mean, top of muzzle. Fairly uh, correct. I would, like I said, I would flatten it out a little bit. Sometimes uh, her, she's got good um, occiputs up as this head gets, um, older the flesh will fall in here and also the back here so you'll have a flatter top skull um, she's flat here she could the cheeks are smooth but i would give her more fill in muzzle and that will probably come with age the reason why i i'm willing to wait on that is because when you her body is very shelly um, she has actually very good structure for her age she has good pro sternum um, she tends to stand like with her front a little forward, but again, I'm not too worried about that because when you go over her structure, it's very good. She has good length of upper arm, she has good lay back of shoulder, and she has a fair amount of pro sternum like for her age. So she has uh, not a lot of rib spring, not a lot of chest development. She's just kind of a little more, her body's like just a little more kind of not put together, like she doesn't have total control of all her muscles. Uh, right now, I would like to see her, to me, she's like a little longer um, than I would like, but again, um, those kind of things can change as they're developing, but as a breeder, um, you know, I'll keep an eye on that. This is also a, a slightly large, larger bitch. She's probably 15 and three quarters, so compared to the two that we just saw, she's not going to get any bigger, but I still think this bitch is definitely feminine. Um, even though she's taller. She she might be taller than, say, the male, the older male that we looked at, but um, she's still feminine. She has a good flat back. I don't like to see a back that um, that's not flat and strong because that's probably not going to get better with a puppy like this. She has quite a lot of development because she spends a lot of time running, so that's, um, that's a good thing. Sometimes they, if they're not running a lot, you know, their rears could go in or out which is just the um, development of the ligaments. So it's really important, especially as you're, as you're growing, to, um, um, you know, for them to get the development of the thigh and develop the ligaments um, uh, for a strong rear. I've seen puppies that have good rears. Uh, when I see them as adults, they're not good, and I suspect that it has a lot to do with exercise and condition. Okay, let's see this one come and go. She coming and going. Um, as I recall, she's um, could be a little, you know, it's her her movement is pretty, um, you know, immature as is her attitude, which but is very enthusiastic. This kind of a puppy, I'm very forgiving of that uh, attitude because it usually ends them being a good show dog. They're enjoying what they're doing. Um, so her, you know, her rear is pretty good. I'd like to see a little more drive. Um, 
an extension of the hock, but you know, not a big deal. She's a little loose in her front coming at you, but again, I really do expect that to get better with development of chest, and I would say her front's a little narrow, but again, I think with the development and depth of chest, and also development of rib spring, um, you know, I my guess would be that she's gonna um, end up being um, a very good mover. But again, um, that's my guess based on her bloodlines and her experience. But you know, it's very possible that that won't happen. So you have to constantly Fish. be reevaluating your dogs and making sure that they're actually living up to the promise that you saw. This bitch is, um, has a beautiful expression. Her eye is dark. Um, it's set obliquely. Um, right now you're looking at her and you're seeing like a little more snipiness to the muzzle, but that's, you know, again, development of flesh, of flesh and then as they mature, like they're gonna get more development here. I would suspect, I don't have a crystal ball, but my expectation is that she will fill in muzzle. So this bitch probably, if we had dog shows, you know, could go out and win specialties now, like win points at specialties. Um, but I don't, I don't, um, I'm not concerned about the break that we're having because I feel like this bitch will be better and better with age. If you look, this is it from the corner of the eye to the nose is, is equidistant here. So she has a little more length to her head, but it's correct because of the proportions. And this bitch has a lot of virtue. And like I said, you know, she's a year old. They kind of go through a stringy stage when their growth is at a high rate. Um, so, I, you know, you kind of have to get through that and then they come back to this and they get more coat. Um, but like I said, she doesn't stand perfect in the rear. I'd like her, I mean, in the front, I'd like her to see her front um, a little behind, you know, a little behind where it is right now. But I also think that this bitch um, is mostly standing that way because she just, you know, kind of doesn't know what she's doing and has had, you know, not a lot of training. So again, I, I really like this one, but I also know that you have to continue to reevaluate them. Okay, let's do this one from the side. I think she's a pretty good mover for her age, uh, maybe a little more enthusiastic than she should be. So you're gonna get a little bounce, which is perfectly fine um, in this uh, at this age. But I think she, for her age, um, you know, she has a movement that will um, probably turn into, you know, a, a good reach and drive and a ground covering pace um, when she gets to be maybe two. She might even need a litter before to fill out. Um, but again, you know, if you're willing to wait on them, um, it's, <laughs> my dogs get, uh, pretend, pretend, most of the time get better with age, which is kind of the goal, because you want, you don't want one that's gonna finish really quick, but then turn out to be overdone. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna see is I have a four month old puppy and I'm just basically going over her for you on the table, um, just so you get an idea of, you know, kind of how things change and more, um, I mean, this dog's obviously too, too young to be shown. Uh, we're just kind of getting her up on the table, but her head is kind of starting to lengthen. It will um, change a lot between now and the time that she's, um, you know, probably eight, nine months old. Um, but what's good about her, um, I feel like will stay good. Um, again, like she's flat here, she's smooth on the sides. I would clean her up a little bit here, but sometimes that's age appropriate because the head at this age is lengthening, but she has good lip line, good under jaw. She has like a fair amount of muzzle, hopefully um, that doesn't, um, mean that she'll sometimes when you have a fair amount of muzzle depending on your line you'll get this pulling out more if that happens uh, that's a deal breaker for me so you know again th this this puppy has potential but you just never know so you have to constantly reevaluate your puppies and if you know your breeding program you'll have a better chance of um, kind of predicting based on past experience but that doesn't always happen so sometimes you have ones that just do crazy stuff and you don't understand why and you might never understand but again um, her shoulders kind of operate at this age um, and I just this happens in um, in my breeding program and I don't worry about it too much because usually it lays back but if it doesn't then that will be a deal breaker for me 
I feel like this is a really good quality puppy. Um, you know, her rear's good, but again, she's gonna go through some stages. Her rear, generally my dogs, like their rears don't go, you know, cow hocked or whatever, but sometimes, you know, they just do, the hocks will get long. I like them to be balanced all the way through, but they're not always that way. So I just kind of wanted you to see this puppy just to see progression. Again, four month old puppy, a lot of potential. Sometimes they do a little stretch. She has neck, but because of her markings, you know, they're harder to see sometimes. Um, but I feel like this will ultimately do a little stretch and this will um, come back. That's what I'm thinking. But like I said, my crystal ball, don't really know. So anyway, she has good length of, um, of tail. So the next thing we're gonna do is I'm, yeah. oh. So the next thing we're gonna do is look at um, a family progression. Um, I have, a, okay, so the older dog, I had mentioned that we were gonna do side movement, so we're gonna do the 10-year-old dog, move him from the side um, while we get the others ready. And then after that, what I wanna do is I have four dogs that directly descend from each other. We have the sire, the uh, the um, the, the um, offspring of the sire, then the offspring of the dam, and then the offspring of the um, of the you know second sire. So we're gonna give that a shot and see how that goes. And then I have one other combination that I want to show you. Okay, so we're back to the um, ten-year-old dog, the fully mature. I think we moved him up and back, but we're going to try it from the side as well. Oh, okay, let's get over here. So, his movement is effortless. He has push drive off the rear. His, his back is flat. His shoulder is mo moving minimally. His tail is straight out from his body but not over the back. Um, and um, the movement is, is, is really effortless. It doesn't look like he's covering ground. Sometimes they take a lot of steps for the amount of ground they cover. And that's not ideal because um, not so much efficient. Um, okay, so move him one, back, one more time up and back. Maybe start down, start down start further. Start further down. <laughs> okay. Okay, so you want the you want the um you want the um the foot to lift only far enough to cover the ground. You want the drive off the rear, um, and you want it to be effortless. So even sometimes they have what appears to be reach and drive, but they're lifting too much in the front. Um Whereas you could see he's he's lifting his leg very uh, um, minimally amount off the ground and um, and then pulling forward um, also off the ground. You don't want them lifting with their front because that's not efficient. You want the least motion possible because when they're out herding in in the field, um, you don't want them to tire. I mean, this is a breed that's sturdy and agile and they're running and um, and turning and that causes obviously energy and we don't want um, we don't want them to tire okay so um, yeah so now what we're gonna do is have four dogs um, which is uh, so this dog 10 years old is the sire of this bitch four years old Okay, and then we're gonna get another dog. Just getting him ready. Move up a little, Kate, okay? A little bit more, another step. Okay, so then. Okay, so the first one, ten-year-old dog, fully mature. Um, when I when I um, when I when I bred the mother of this one to him, um, I looked at dog type for type, 
and the mother had beautiful balance and I was looking for um, a little head improvement on the mother. Uh, she was very good quality but there was a couple things with her head and her eye that I wanted to improve. So I bred him um, to, to that bitch and I got this one. And I feel like this one uh, is exceptional. Like I said, she's a little lacking in coat, so she might appear slightly long, but ideally, um, to me, she's you know not that way. Again, not a you know enthusiastic show dog. Um, so then, so so when I when I bred when I wanted to breed her, I basically did a breeding. The dog that I that I um, bred her to um, is one of my dogs, but not he's no longer with us. And what I wanted to do was basically keep the quality. Um, and I bred her to her um, grandsire. So he's not here, but what I got from the breeding is this dog. And um, this is a three-year-old dog. Uh, just turn him for a second. And um, I love that, I love his outline. Um, I love his um, skull. And uh, again, he's three and not necessarily, you know, the finished product at this point. Okay, he has really good um, layback and really good post sternum. He's a very good mover and um, basically got pretty much what I wanted from the breeding. His sire, when I did the breeding, I think, was like 10 or 11. And this is the only male um, that I've kept from that, um, from that breeding. I mean, from, from the male. This is the only uh, male offspring that I have from the sire, um, which of the dog that was um, that died, he died when he was 12. Um, so like I said, I bred uh, to him. He was a sire of um, 64 champions to date. And um, this was the only male that I kept from him. I don't keep males unless I feel like they're exceptional and that if they belong to somebody else, including somebody that made it um, less convenient to breed to, that I would breed to them. I'm not gonna breed to a dog just because I own it um, if it's not the best breeding that I can do. Okay, so then this one I bred um, to a sable bitch that has a fair amount of AOC family in her, um, but is a uh, tr um, trifector table. So trifector table, you can get um, trifector tables or tricolors. So the reason I did this breeding is actually him and the mother are, um, have a fair amount of similarities. The mother has a little bit more length of head. Um, I was looking to improve the eye on the mother. The mother had like a very beautiful compact body and lots of neck and was an excellent mover. So I did the breeding. This one was a singleton and you know I have hopes for her going forward um, because of her pedigree. I can go a lot of different directions at this point. Um, I, I'm thinking that I will breed her. She's almost a year old so when she's you know a year or you know 15 months or so I will breed her kind of back into the pedigree of a similar pedigree to her grandsire um, and um, and then we will see how we go from there but basically as a breeder I feel like you have to know where you've been if, if possible because some newer breeders don't have as much experience but I also feel like you need to know where you're going and with each generation you need to know where um, what you're looking to improve and if you don't get that improvement there's absolutely nothing wrong with not keeping anything from the litter I think um, a lot of people um, feel like they need to keep something from every litter because uh, it was expensive or um, you know it wasn't um, what they wanted um, you know, it wasn't necessarily what they wanted, but, you know, it's good enough or whatever. And I kind of feel like I keep a very limited amount of dogs, and I really want them to be the best of the best. So, um, again, I love this puppy, the development that she has so far, So, but she's, you know, still a work in progress, so we'll have to wait and see. Okay, so that's them. And then I have two more dogs. Um, in the meantime, there was a question. There was a request to move um, the sable dog from the side. Um, and then, um, and then we have um, a bitch and um, her son, which were two of the other ones you saw. But um, I wanted to um, just go over um, what um, what my goal was in, a, in the breeding and that, what I achieved and and where I might want to go going forward. So 
So this sable dog, again, he's just under two, um, and we're gonna we're gonna move him from the side. So, so this dog, I would give him a little more push off on the rear. Um, part of it, I think, is that, you know, he finished a year ago as a young dog, wasn't shown that much, and I feel like, you know, more time on the leash, he will, he will um, learn how to um, extend himself, because I think he's fairly well put together. Um, I would like, you know, like I said, a little more reach and a little more uh, push off the rear. Um, like I said, I think that he has quite a lot of virtue and um, they all have faults and so that's kind of how I would categorize that. Um, I feel like, and I, you know, I'll say this because he, he's really not my breed, well he's not my breeding at all, but I feel like, you know, any person would be uh, extremely happy to find this dog in the ring. Okay, so then, thanks. And then, so let's do, um, we have um, two dogs that were seen before. We have the nine-year-old bitch that was spayed, and then we have her son, which was the blue that was two years old. Uh, yeah, just two, just turned two last week. So, I had a very beautiful bitch um, that was um, sired by, um, you know, a dog that was like a super typey dog, very good movement. Um, and I had this bitch, and I bred her a certain, a couple different times, and I just didn't know, I couldn't get what I what I was looking for, so I hadn't kept anything from her before. Um, quite a quite a while ago, I had seen a sable puppy out on the west coast. Um, he, uh, get her up a step. She's just turn turn around, see if she does better. She's like not cooperating, but. Um, so it was a sable dog that I had seen a while ago at a national as a puppy, and then I had seen him since then. And he was a very, very virtuous dog. I loved his um, skull. I loved his expression, his uh, his amount, you know, his amount, his uh, outline. And so I thought, you know what? I've loved this dog for a while, and I have had him in the back of my mind for a while. And I'm just going to wing it. It was an outcross. It was a blue to a sable, which sometimes cuts your. Um, your uh, choices because when you breed a blue to a sable you can get a sable merle which is perfectly fine to show in my opinion um, except for if they have blue eyes so they can have blue eyes because they do have the merle gene but they're not acceptable to show the dog with flecks in their eyes any fleck any blue in the eyes so you know you might get one puppy and it's a sable merle with blue eyes or you might I don't traditionally wouldn't think I would keep a sable merle male until unless they were just like exceptional. Um, so I did this breeding, it was a total outcross. Then I got this bitch who I just feel like this bitch is exceptional. Um, like I said, right now, you know, she's nine, she looks a little longer than I would like her to look, but also, you know, has quite a lot of coat for her and the texture changes slightly when they're, um, when they're um, spayed. So I, I bred her several times and I bred her once to um, a brother of the dog that I had that I said um, produced 60 champions. And then, um, and then um, I, um, I got a champion dog, a tricolor um, male. And I chose not to keep him, to sell him with stud rights, which basically um, I felt like provided me with his lineage um, if I if I needed to go back to that, um, so I bred her a couple more times out crosses, and it really just nothing clicked. And I just really love this bitch so much, and I wanted to make sure she stayed in my breeding program. So at the, her last breeding, I bred her to a dog that I had seen at the national, that was a grandson of my dog that produced you know the 60 champions, and also the dog, the nine-year-old dog. And um, so I did that breeding, and then I got this dog. Now, this is what Shelties do for you because um, I thought the two dogs, the dog and the bitch that I bred together, were more similar than different. Um, but and it, so they didn't cross fault as well as they might could have. But 
I felt like I needed to go back into a familiar pedigree in order to get something from the from the litter. So we got this male. He's you know larger than both the parents, um, but he is um, you know has a lot of virtue. He has a beautiful outline. Is very balanced, and I feel like going forward, I can um, I can. Um, you know, use him in my breeding program. I might not be able to use him right away because I don't have the right bitch or I don't have a bitch with the right bloodlines or do the, you know, health clearances or whatever the issue is, I may not be able to use him. But going forward, and generally I don't keep males, but, well, that's not true. I keep males, but I, don't, I try to cut back on the amount of males. But if I have something that I'm trying to keep in my breeding program um, because of the virtue, then I'm willing to you know, keep them around and uh, see what, um, you know, see what I can do with them. So, um, his, this dog also belongs to my daughter and she um, showed him from uh, start to finish and he finished with several um, specialty majors. So, actually, Kate, why don't you move him from the side? I feel like this one is a good, a really good mover from the side, for, especially for a dog his age. Okay, well, he's fighting the leash a little bit, but you can see that he has really good drive off the rear, and I think he has, um, you know, good a good um, amount of extension in the front without lifting at all, which is very efficient, obviously. So again, for a dog his age, you know, I feel like he has a lot of virtue, and I feel like he has room to room to go, and so you know, we'll see how it goes. He's a two-year-old dog. Um, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll see where it goes. I feel like at this point he will fulfill his potential. But again, you know, we have to see because he's not a fully mature dog. Okay. So there was one question about um, have you done any, the question is have you done any outcrosses with the Sable from Canada? So the reason I bought that dog is because I um, love so much about him and I really like the family and I actually tried to breed to his sire several times and for whatever reason it just didn't work out um, you know I the owners were away or, or whatever but his but I saw this dog and literally on a whim um, I bought him because again I saw I really liked his virtue I really admired the family and I felt like I had to um, had to um, you know outcross and um, and you know I need to outcross because a lot of my dogs are tightly bred and I do have plans of breeding him um, you know to my stuff and also um, you know possibly um, some blues which um, because he's pure for sable um, all you can get is trifactored sables and sable merles which is an ideal but I feel like um, if I get something from that breeding I can go back into my own um, dogs and use that as an outcross so basically that's why um, that's why I purchased him it was very much on a whim like I said but I just feel like the dog has so much virtue um, that I really wanted to see if incorporating him in my breeding program and the family that he represents would be something um, I could do with success so that pretty much concludes um, what I have for you as far as the dogs do you want to do closing thoughts and then ask that? I don't see any questions, but um, maybe we can give the opportunity for people. Okay, um, so now would be a good time for um, if anybody has questions, I can uh, ask, I can answer specific questions about the dogs, about um, the standard, or about the, um, um, you know, just breeding in general, and breeding theory, and, and that kind of thing. So I don't know if there's any questions, but this would be a time where we can take some time and um, answer answer questions if you have specific questions. Any final thoughts? Any final wrap-up thoughts? Um, so for final thoughts, um, I really, I feel like this is a hard breed. Most people, you know, I think would think this is a hard breed to understand because, again, we do have a lot of different types and they can be correct based on the application of this. Yeah. Um, applications of the standard if they if they adhere to the standard and they have virtue um, that's basically what you're looking for um, and I um, so for me as a breeder 
I am constantly learning. I feel like as a breeder, you never stop learning. I feel like if I go and speak to, um, hear people speak about, you know, other breeds, even though they um, may not, it might, I, I might not be particularly, there wouldn't be a reason why I would necessarily be interested in that breed as far as judging or, or breeding them myself. I feel like people that are breeding successfully and have really successful and virtuous dogs have a reason why they're doing what they're doing and you can always learn from from somebody um, that's that's doing breeding for virtue and correct type so I as a, um, a breeder really like to see that kind of thing and it inspires me and I'm hoping that what I've imparted with you and a little bit of my thought process and how I get where I am um, uh, will um, We'll give some other people food for thought. Okay, we have a couple questions coming okay. through. Um, one is, what what would you expect to improve with age? What would I expect from uh, to improve with age? Just I know you mentioned it um, oh, specifically, but so the question is, what would I expect to improve with age? So I feel like uh, the rib spring for sure, the depth of chest, um, um, the degree of muzzle. And sometimes the degree, the depth of underdog, not necessarily, you know, they, if they're snipey, they're not necessarily going to improve with that. Um, what would, if they have uh, a smooth zygomatic arch, when flesh comes in, you're going to um, get a more, a more uh, blocky looking back skull and to me a more pleasing back skull. Um, sometimes the, um, the flesh around the occiput pulls in and gives them, you know, more skull going back. And, and um, some things that don't improve with age, I don't think, is a high uh, frontal bone, uh, a, a round eye, a light eye, um, a forward set eye, a bulging eye. None of that will, will improve with age, in, in my uh, opinion, if they're, if they're out of balance and have kind of a stuffy look to them or not enough neck. I don't feel like that's going to improve much past a year. Um, I think movement will improve. I think, um, I think definitely breadth of um, chest and, and uh, depth of chest and spring of rib will add to you know better movement coming and going i mean that's coming and then i also think that just further development of muscle and uh, ligaments will can improve not always um the um, um the drive in the rear and also you know how they how they stand in the rear and we have a question on what the what do you think is the drag of the breed the biggest drag on the breed currently I feel like we have a lot of dogs that might not have a lot of faults, but don't have a lot of virtue. And I feel like judging um, people that are judging our breed is easier to find fault and eliminate a dog for fault when you um, when you're judging rather than look for virtue. Because I think faults are easier to. Um, learn than virtue and I feel like when you eliminate dogs because of faults you end up with a common dog that may not have uh, virtue so they might have few faults but they also have few virtues and I feel like um, we have a lot of common dogs I feel like we have a lot of prominent uh, frontal bones a lot of deep stops the head should be very light and and um, and you know this should be a very elegant breed and I feel like we don't necessarily have a lot of that. Okay. Another one is if you had to pick one piece of the Sheltie that you feel can make or break a dog what would it be? Well okay so the question is if I had to pick one thing about a Sheltie that would make or break, break um, the dog? Is that what you're saying? Yes. If, okay yeah. so that's a really difficult question because I feel like the the quality of a dog is um, multifaceted and parts have to come together to actually make a pleasing dog. So it, what? So they have to have um, proper balance and symmetry and they have to not have any one part that um, stands out from the other. Uh, this might, in a puppy, you know, as they're growing, 
might be a little harder to find, but in an adult, you really want one that's you know has proper balance and symmetry. Having said that, to me, a Sheltie cannot be a good specimen without a correct head and without correct expression. And again, a lot of times there's back and forth amongst Sheltie breeders as to you know what's more important, the head or the movement. And to me, it's got to be all there. Um, I don't want to keep one that's a terrible mover. Um, and I don't want to keep one that has a terrible head. And I don't want to keep one that has good movement with a terrible head or a terrible head with good movement. So I, it's a really hard question. I mean, I basically want it all. I can't get it all, obviously. But the closer you get to having all these virtues um, that are important to the breed, the better type you'll have and, you know, the better dogs you'll have. And just to add to that, it wasn't really part of the question, you have to be the biggest, the harshest critic of your own breeding program. Um, as much as I would like to, um, you know, have this beautiful puppy turn out, um, there's a lot that can go wrong. The bite can come in wrong. They can go oversized. Um, their head can go too long. It cannot extend sometimes, and it's too short and out of balance. So, you know, there's a lot of things that go wrong, and you can't fall in love with the... Uh, promise of a young puppy and not continue to evaluate that dog and be the harshest critic of that particular dog. Okay. Another one is what age do you, at what ages do you evaluate your puppy since they change so much with age? I'm constantly evaluating them, honestly. Like, I, 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 I like to look at them at about eight weeks, and a lot of them you can eliminate at eight weeks because, you know, they might not have muzzle or they might have round eyes or they might be too big or too small or obviously not have, you know, two testicles or that kind of thing. But um, you can see ones with potential. I like to see, you know, some muzzle. I like to see the back skull pretty clean, but they are fairly clean at that age. And I like to see... Um, good planes. Sometimes the eye doesn't look that pretty at eight weeks. It should be dark, but sometimes the set will change. The head pulls out starting at about 12 weeks um, and can really change up until about, um, you know, eight months or so. So the puppy that we looked at that's almost a year, um, I don't see her, her head pulling out anymore. I feel like it's pulled out and then it will continue to fill in and the flesh and as she gains weight and gets more mature, you know, you'll have more muzzle, but this will stay the same, hopefully. And, um, you know, her skull is flat. I think it'll get flatter. Sometimes when the head starts to pull out, they get prominence over the eyes and it goes away. If it doesn't go away, um, you know, that's kind of a deal breaker for me. So um, I kind of evaluate them on, on an ongoing basis. I, I really like to look at them on a daily basis. I do some of my best thinking when I'm out with my dog scooping and just watching them run around. Um, I really enjoy looking at them and, and evaluating them and um, just kind of deciding like what my best dog is at the time and, and rating them. I mean, I'm always, you know, kind of have a, a hierarchy in my mind of which one I think is the best one, which is second best, third best. And that changes a lot, you know, with upcoming generations, which I think is good because like you're progressing. Um, I think that um, at three months to five or six months is a rate of high growth and their bones don't grow at the same rate. So you might have ones that are just kind of go out of balance, they're, they're, they don't have bend and stifle, their shoulders you know, go up and there's just a lot of things. So if I've kept them to three months, I try not to really make decisions between three and five months. And then I start liking them to come together back at, you know, within reason, like six, seven months. I honestly don't feel like uh, Shelties, sh I mean, not that they shouldn't be shown at six months, but I don't think they look their best at six months. I think they start to come into their own around eight months. And then, you know, then at that point, you can kind of tell, like, the good things that are going to stay and the things that you might could live with because you've seen in the past that they can improve with age. And then there's some things that you see that um, are just not gonna change. Another question is, what would you like to see improved in five years as far as something that takes a couple generations to fix? In my breeding program? Um, in the breed as a whole. Okay, so in the breed as a whole, the question is, what would I like to see improve? In five years, like five years. long term things that take multiple generations to fix. Um, I would like to see um, 
better movement in Shelties. Um, a lot of a lot of what we have now is dogs that kind of plot along and um, they have adequate reach, but it's not really, you know, really get down and move efficiently. Um, I, I, I think a lot of people aren't knowledgeable about good movement. I feel like Shelties in general don't necessarily, you know, have as good a movement as some breeds like Aussies and Siberians and some of those breeds. I feel like, you know, we definitely could do a better job striving for that. I also feel like, you know, we have a lot of head faults, um, and I would like to see people really trying for the whole dog. Um, you know, it's really easy to say, well, I have good heads and that's all that matters, or I have good movement and that's all that matters, but like, you want the whole dog. I don't understand that particular argument. So, you know, going down the line, I just like to see, you know, better quality dogs, better type. I think people should select, be harsher in their selection. Um, and make sure they're really progressing from generation to generation. Okay, and the last question I see, uh, so if anyone else has any questions, please make sure to put them in now. Uh, the last question I see is, is there a dog that you regret not breeding to when they were around? There probably are several. Um, thinking about, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to really get into specifics, but I mean, there's always, dogs when you look back. Um, before I breed to dogs, I really want to see what they produced, and I like to see what they produce with a similar pedigree if possible to what I have, which isn't always possible. But then also what's really important to me is is, is seeing the get from a dog that um, that is um, similar type to the bitch I'm looking to breed to that dog. What's so invaluable to me because of the amount of time that I've been doing this is I there's often times where I've seen you know five generations of dogs not necessarily every single dog in the pedigree but like definitely you know female you know the female line or the male line or, or whatever I, there can be back five generations when it's possible for me to see um, see the dog um, probably um, I mean for the first, I'd say, 15 years of my life, like I wasn't really intricately involved in the breeding of the dogs. Um, since, and then for a while it was both of us, and then my mom, you know, kind of, um, you know, took a back seat a little bit, and I still love when she comes up and I get all the dogs out, and I just want her to see them, and I think she puts emphasis on things that I might put less emphasis on, and, and vice versa. Um, but I feel like, um, you know, what she left me was a very strong line of producing bitches, which is so invaluable. So I feel like, um, you know, in the past there was a dog named um, Champion Calcourt Luke, who was a Champion Halsers Peter Pumpkin dog, uh, son, and he was a very prolific sire. Um, it was kind of before my time when I was, you know, making active breeding decisions. Um, but I really probably feel like that dog produced so many beautiful daughters that, you know, I would like to have one. And if that were dog were around today, I'm sure I would, you know, be incorporating him into my breeding program. Um, and I, um, I found there were some other dogs that, you know, say, um, were, uh, producing really well say like 10 years ago and at that point I actually bred to that dog a lot and I felt like I might be bringing myself into a corner but I felt like it was working with my bloodlines and so that I was just going to do it and then figure it out later on so what I usually try to do is breed for the, breed it, the breeding I'm doing not necessarily think like oh well wait a minute I could do this breeding and then after that I'll do that breeding and then I'll do that breeding because I kind of feel like maybe that gets you away from the quality um, that you're ultimately trying to achieve. Um, I really can't, you kind of caught me off guard on this question. So, you know, there's at least four or five dogs that, you know, I would have loved to incorporate some kind of before I was actively involved in breeding decisions, but then, you know. We have a couple more questions. Um, we've, that looks like three. Uh, the one I'll start with is, do you feel satisfied with the judging of Shelties? It's hard to follow since sometimes it's inconsistent. Um... Honestly, not really, because um, I think there's some really, really good judges from other breeds. I think 
it's hard to really appreciate the nuance of this breed, but it's so important. A lot of judges don't thoroughly go over their heads, and they, like I said, will eliminate a dog for you know a missing tooth. A dog should be should have a scissor bite. They should um, missing teeth are faulty, but I would not throw out a virtuous dog for missing teeth. Um, to me, it has to be a scissor bite, but for missing teeth. Um, I kind of feel like a lot of judges today um, are, it's, you know, like I said, it's easier to judge faults than virtue. And, you know, I'm very, very passionate about this breed. And I've really, like, worked, you know, my whole life to set goals for myself and try to get better dogs and breed better dogs. But, you know, a lot of times under some judges, um, you know, some of the better ones are the odd man out, and if you don't really, really know the breed, um, you, um, you know, you might completely pass by something with virtue. And so I think in a lot of areas, um, you know, dogs that wouldn't have been rewarded, um, you know, 15, 20 years ago because it took, you know, 24 bitches for a major and now we're down to, you know, eight or nine bitches for an eight major in some areas are possibly being rewarded and finishing that they couldn't, they weren't good enough to finish 15, 20 years ago. Okay, two more questions. How important is the amount of coat for you, especially in a puppy? Not important. I mean, I don't, I, and sometimes we have too much coat and it, it's just hard to find. They look out of balance and um, it's hard to find um, the correct symmetry in that um, I would I would rather see a puppy with less hair um, than one that has uh, too much hair and and too much um, and it interferes with the outline um, you know I feel like sometimes you can see a, a better dog looks better you know with less hair so okay the last question and I think we'll end on this because our battery is getting low okay. uh, is the best advice for someone just starting out in showing and breeding shelties um, obviously, you know, you want to find a mentor, but you don't want to necessarily find a mentor that's going to tell you everything to do and that you're not going to kind of go out on your own. Like, a, a, eventually, you know, you might have somebody that sells you a dog and, like, helps you get started, but I feel like you have to kind of move past um, the mentor mentor -y stage. I mean, it's great mentors are great mentors, but you ultimately have to learn and you have to experiment and you have to be, you know, kind of develop your own opinions and, you know, where you're going to put your emphasis. Um, you know, sometimes you can only, you know, stick with a mentor a certain amount of time. Um, so, you know, obviously great mentors are super important, but I think some mentors would like you to um, you know, kind of stay under their thumb rather than encourage you to kind of get out on your own and like make some mistakes and kind of learn, you know, learn from your mistakes. So, you know, I think a good mentor is instrumental, but I also think it's important, you know, once you buy a dog from somebody that you make sure that you go around and, you know, look at other families of dogs and, and you know, visit other breeders and speak to other breeders and kind of come to your own conclusion about, you know, um, who you might want to Move this family of dogs you might want to move forward or with or inc incorporate into your breeding program. So let, let me just tell you, say uh, this was a this was obviously a team effort. I really like to thank uh, my husband who really kind of stepped in and um, you know kind of put together the audio video portion and really kind of took this on and uh, not very supportive of the dogs but not particularly interested in the showing aspect of it so I really thank him I want to thank my helpers I had four uh, Natalie um, Hollinger who's uh, came from Virginia to help and she's on the camera and uh, fielding the questions my friend Carrie Newcomb who lives locally and been a fancier for quite a long time my daughter Kate who's 19 and has been involved in the breeding and um, and showing you know, of our of our uh, our family t to some extent, um, and is very helpful, very interested, and have been washing dogs and grooming dogs for a few days. And then also, um, our adopted family member, uh, 
Kate, Katie Kowalski over here, who's multi-talented, um, been grooming dogs late into the night. I am incapacitated by uh, a um, surgery and um, not particularly helpful. So I was really, really glad that people stepped up and made this, as I hope you'll consider a success. And I'd be happy to answer questions that come up if you wanna, um, you know, I guess put them on the video. They're gonna have it posted or um, or go to my Facebook directly to ask because um, I'm all about, you know, um, answering questions and, you know, having people fall in love with history that I've been passionate about for my whole life. So thanks so much for attending and, you know, go forward and let me know your questions. Thank you.